I tell you the title of the message today, you're going, I'm doing it for more than one reason. But a lot of times, I want to tell you what happened years ago. It happened every Sunday. My mama would cook dinner. Kenny and Becky can tell you that. Wanted everybody in the church, if they could come eat. She just had a bunch of cook. We sat down, and every Sunday that I can remember for quite a while, my son Brian would say, Mama, what did the preacher preach on today? And my mama would just had a way of just busting out laughing, and she never was able to answer that question. But she, it was funny that uh, maybe she couldn't tell exactly what I preached on or what the preacher preached on or whatever. But when I give you the title of this message, you will never forget it. I'm going to call it the bow weevil. The bow weevil. The weevil. Now I know little genius daddy hated the bow weevil. And, and let me tell you about that bow weevil. That thing in 1960 that year I think it was it was $23 billion lost to the United States of America because of the bow weevil. A bow weevil is what caused, according to what I read, 6 million African Americans that did make a living. See, after slavery, they still needed a job, but 6 million of them, over 6 million, went up north to find jobs. Most of them went into work like in Chicago, around Chicago, Illinois, and, uh, and, and, and along in there at them uh, steel factories. So, and a lot of farmers lost their land, the houses, and moved north to, to, to make a living. And I didn't know how them things worked, but they were in Mexico. And they can't fly very far. How they got across the Rio Grande into Texas? Don't know. I got some ideas. But one, one of those things, I had it wrote down, at one bow weevil, one bow weevil at one time will have hatched two million at one time. And they, what the bow weevil does is take its funny little snout stick into the bud of the cotton and lays its eggs in there, and it's two million that eats that cotton up and then goes eats other cotton. And then that didn't take long. They just went everywhere around. They were here and further north, everywhere. People hated it. But it was called to my attention and got me to reading about it. And I said, that fits right into today's message. But in 1916, a place called Enterprise, you can read it on your, looking it up on your telephone or whatever, it's Enterprise, Alabama. It's in Coffee County. I kind of like that. I don't know if it's community or, or which one it was. But in Coffee County, Alabama, <coughs> in fact, this place in 1916 failed distant Enterprise alone in that one cotton gin, 15,000 plus bales of hay in 1916. 1917, a little over 4,000. The next year it was zero. And of all things, and it's still standing today, and it's a beautiful thing, but it's a statue of a woman right there in Enterprise, Alabama. She's standing real tall, and she's got a bowl, and in that bowl it weighs 50-something pounds, a statue of a bow wheel. And it's good to look at the, look it up sometimes. It makes you, if you was ever a farmer, it makes you. Uh. And a lot of people say, "Well, why in the world would you dedicate and honor and call that you your heroic figure?" That's the question asked. So the only reason I name it Bow Weevil is the answer that Enterprise Alabama says they made their living all of them around there farming raising cotton. But because the bow weevil came, it showed them that they can make more money raising peanuts. 
<laughs> and other things. See, they would have never started raising peanuts and other products. They were just stuck on cotton. That's all they did. But then they went to having peanuts, and now, now we got Jiffy and everything else. And all kinds of oil and everything. So, the bow weaver in Enterprise, Alabama. It's got it up there. It was in 1916, I believe, is when that was put up. But you check it out. If you got your Bible, we're going to go to Romans chapter 8. And I'm so glad it's a chapter 8 and it don't stop on chapter 7. Amen. Hallelujah. A lot of people stop on chapter 7. Now, you know, Romans chapter 7, and while you're looking, I'm going to remind you, Wednesday night, Revelation chapter 11, the chapter we're going to study, is coming Wednesday night. And I'm so thankful for you wonderful people. And I'm so excited to go ahead and start early enough that we finish quick and, and, and eat that good food they brought. <laughs> so that, that's been so good. Now they got coffee and food and everything else after we get through. That's Revelation chapter 11. That's where we're going to be Wednesday night at 6 o'clock back in the fellowship hall. And Romans... Chapter 7 talks about the law. Chapter 10. Huh? Yeah. Chapter 10. Chapter 10. For, for Revelation. Revelation. Yeah, Revelation 10. I don't know why I got left with Revelation. We're on Romans. I'm, look, I really tried to see if I knew what was going on. <laughs> right. Are we on Romans? Romans chapter 8? In Romans chapter 8. And Wednesday night, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 10. I got straightened right. out. Oh, I was being smart. I wasn't very smart, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Romans chapter 8, but chapter 7 is the law. And that's where Paul says, there's no good thing in me. He says, I can't help it, but chapter 7, verse 17 says, Now then, it is no longer I that does it, but sin that dwells in me does these things I don't want to do. And he says in chapter 7, I did not know what sin was until the law put his finger on what sin is and I was not convicted until I saw what I was doing was against God. And that law just burdened him down and pushed him down. But now chapter 8 verse 1, hallelujah. There is therefore now condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And you know, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free of that law of sin and death. Let me tell you what. Jesus says, who I make free is free indeed. Jesus Christ is the answer. You, first of all, got to admit that you have sin in your life. But once you confess your sin, Jesus Christ forgives us of all our sins that we confess and believe and he washes them away never to remember them anymore and he removes them as far as the east is from the west two lines that will never meet again. My friends, sometimes we are our worst enemy. Once you come to Christ, he forgives you and is not held against you. But however we got people that kind of misuse and take advantage and say, well, I'm in the New Testament. I can just keep on the sinning and God will keep on forgiving. The Bible says it's dangerous to walk on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you take it lightly that he died on the cross and shed his blood and do not realize that you need to live without sin, we're not perfect, but you don't go and sin and say, uh-oh, I sinned and I already know you was going to do it. You gotta grow up and you gotta say, Lord, help me. Give me strength. Help me to crucify that flesh that I won't follow it. My friend, I found out that flesh is very, very powerful. Flesh can really pull you down. Your flesh can. I I'm amazed how powerful it is. It's the nature of this world. It's kin to this world because Adam and Eve sold ourselves to this world, our flesh. But Jesus Christ came to set us free from this world. God used Moses to use the law to put his finger on it and, and to say, let me tell you what, 
No one, if they said they kept the law, guess what? They just told you a story. The Bible says no one can keep the law except the Lord himself. Because the flesh is against the law. But the law is to point out you need a Savior. Even Job, the oldest book in the Bible, Job says, Lord, I need an intercessor. I need a mediator to stand between me and you and the sins that keep creeping up on me. I need that mediator. And praise God that mediator came. He came born of a virgin Mary. He came born in Bethlehem. He was born and put in a cow trough was his bed. And let me tell you what, he didn't have, he did, he, it could have been born anywhere, but he was born into the least and the lowest place there could be. He could have been laid in a golden bed, but no, he was laid in a trough that fed the cows. He was put there because there's nobody can say that he's too high up for me. He lowered himself lower than anything there could be. He done that willingly. And let me tell you what, he grew up at the age of 12. We know he was preaching in the synagogue, teaching them the law, the, I mean, the word of God and the law, and he was laying it out to them. And then when he's the age of 30, it's when he walked down the, into that water, and John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. All the other lambs that were killed by the thousands and thousands and thousands every year on that one day of atonement only covered their sins. But when Jesus' blood was shed, John knew that it was going to wash the sins away, never to be remembered no more. John says, I'm not worthy to baptize you. Jesus says, the word says, you've got to baptize me, John. So we got to obey the word. So John baptized him. And that same dove that I think that Noah let loose, and it came right back and he let loose again. And it came back and it brought a part of a fig tree leaf. And then when it left, it never did come, but it never did light again until the Lord Jesus Christ rose up out of that water in the river Jordan and he was clean and a dove lit on him. That dove lit on him. And John says, I bear witness that the one the dove would land on would be the Savior of the world. Amen. Jesus Christ is our only Savior, our only hope. And let me tell you, we was discussing earlier, it's amazing how the world, the people, and other religions hate Jesus the name Jesus, Jesus Christ, and hate Israel. Let me tell you, we will rule and reign from Israel, and it's not going to be long from now. And the devil knows that, but the devil's controlling this world. But don't you back up, don't you give up. There's hope. I see that God's beginning to do things, and don't you back up. Don't give up. Keep praying. The devil wants you to be like I almost have become, and maybe a little bit, but I'm going to straighten up. I pretty well have done gave up on America until God put the new speaker of the house in. And my friend, he's a genuine Christian and he loves the Lord. His name is Mike Johnson. He's from Louisiana. But he holds that Bible up and they say, what do you believe? They said, this right here. They said he's hiding money. He's got money. He's just like all the other politicians. They've investigated. Guess how much money he's got? Less than you got. That's right. You know what he does? Just enough to feed his family. Just enough to feed his family. And he gives it all away. They say, well, he's a racist. He saw this little black boy that didn't have a home. He said, come and I'll give you a home. He adopts children, no matter what their color are. And is and whatever. He's good to them. He's a, he's a genuine Christian man. They try to find stuff wrong with him. And end up, let me tell you, when he spoke in the White House, I was at the Pentagon, they all stood up and clapped. Yes. If I spoke, they would throw rocks at me. <laughs> God with that man. Hallelujah. But anyway, I didn't mean to get all excited over that, but God's answering our prayer. Amen. Amen. And let me tell you, it's just like the news. If we're not careful. We only talk about the bad things, and God does something good we never speak of. God's at work. Don't you forget that. God's at work. But there is no condemnation of them in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And uh, it says, the law and spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free for what? The law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, 
and for sin he condemned that sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit let me tell you it's fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. without him you won't make it you can't make it there's no hope for you but with him you're going to be make, you're going to make it for they in verse 5 they're after the flesh mind the things of the flesh but they that are after spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded, to be carnally minded is what? Death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. If we don't have excitement, life, and peace, we're not living in the spirit like God wants us to. How do you live in the spirit? By trusting God, by reading the word, and the word is Jesus Christ. It says that in St. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same it was the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. We call Him the Son of the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now go on down to verse 7 of Romans chapter 8. I mean, I need to get further than that. Let me get down to verse 18. Look at, look at verse 18. That's the beginning of a new paragraph. But Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be, be revealed in us. Thank God for that. Now I get to verse 26. I'm going to back up to 25. Romans 8, 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, verse 26, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that, what's that word? Oh. All things work together for good. And all things are not good, but all things work together for good. Everything that happens to you if you love God, though the devil would say God doesn't love you, is for good. It's important that it happens. That sets us free of this old worldly nature. That cleanses us. It, it says, if you remember we read it, the sufferings of this present world is not going to be compared to glory. You're going to re be revealed. The more you suffer, the more you're going to experience the will of God. The cross makes you suffer. When you crucify that flesh, it's painful. The Bible says the second death won't hurt you. It's that first death that's painful and that first death is nailing your old flesh to the cross and dying to this old wicked world that's a temptation to us. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And it says in verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also predestinated. And you know, people grab that and get all men out of shape. They don't, they don't know what that word means. They, they form religions talking about predestination. <laughs> what that's saying is that God knew you before you was ever born. And predestined means he called you. He called you unto himself. So he has reached out to you. He's called you. He loves you. He died for you. He wants you to come to him. <coughs> to be comforted to the image of his son or conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. See, God has called us to be conformed to the image of his son. Let me tell you, we need, what God wants is to see his son in us. John the Baptist said it perfect. 
He said, John the Baptist has got to decrease before Jesus can increase. Can I tell you something? In my life, Reggie Foreman's got to decrease before Jesus will increase. You know, the Bible says we need to grow up in him. The word is Jesus. So let's make like this. This here is Jesus. And since I'm slim and tall, this is me. This is Reggie. The Bible says we've got to grow up in him. So what is this? This is Jesus. And Reggie, he gets part the way in and he slows down. But after a while, he finally gets on. What do you see now? You don't see Reggie anymore. You only see Jesus, the word of God. So we need to grow up in, in God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I read verse 26 again. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what to pray for as we ought. That's Romans 8, 26. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groaning, groanings which cannot be uttered. You see, when you read the Word of God, you might say, well, that don't, it doesn't do me any good. It ain't doing your flesh any good. Your flesh don't want you to read it. And it's amazing that no matter what, if I'm not careful, if I'm not careful, and I'm trying to teach my grandson how to study better at school and stuff, I said, Maddox, your problem is, is when you read your lesson, you out there fishing and throwing baits and figuring out which bait it is. Oh, you know that, Papa. I said, because I do the same thing. I sit down and read my Bible, and then I'm trying to figure out how to fix the lawnmower. <laughs> I'm working on a lawnmower instead of reading the Bible. I'll be thinking about what I need to do and what I don't need to do and all that. Where I need to let my mind be on what I'm doing. And the best thing to do is to do like I know of one or two people that do. Read out loud. You might need to get by yourself. But when you read out loud, it, it's different. You remember it. And I believe it scares the devil to slap off. And then thumps. But anyway, the Spirit helps our infirmities. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. What does that mean? That means that the Spirit of God lives in you. And the Bible says when you hurt, God hurts. It says he's touched with all the feelings of our infirmities. He knows that. And when you have the Word of God in you, has there ever been times that when you get ready to pray and maybe all you could do is cry or boo-hoo? The Spirit of God is doing that through you. That's all right. That's good. Let God pray through you. Let the Spirit talk to God. He says in verse 27, He searches, he that searches the heart knows what is the mind and of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You know, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is making intercession for you. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And he's praying right now for you and I. Amen. Jesus loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. That's right. No matter what, you know, a child can teach us something this morning. Jesus loves us. And we need to love him back. And in verse 28 is where I get the name Bo Weevil. You see, Enterprise Alabama <coughs> said the Bow Weevil was a blessing in disguise. You know, enterprise means to be able to make it. <laughs> Go ahead. And so they began to enterprise because the bow weevil forced them to take a better route. Verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. To whom he did foreknow, he did also predestine to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. You see, the silversmith builds a fire, puts the silver ore in. He builds a fire that's so hot, he scrapes the black, draws off, throws it away. He's got a dipper. But he doesn't stop. He puts more wood, he gets the fire hotter. And let me tell you, you, get a, you, you can see what's going on there. And he does it again. And he puts more wood and gets the fire roared. And you know, you're in a fire. And a fire is for one reason. God baptizes you with the Holy Ghost and what? 
fire. It said on them cloven tongues of fire. Fire purifies. Fire will bring the impurities to the top. And that silversmith will scrape again. And in Proverbs it says, how long will you keep doing that? How long will you keep adding heat to the fire? And the silver can talk. It says, Mr. Silversmith, you must hate my guts. You keep getting it hotter and hotter and making me uncomfortable. Keeps on and on. You know when he stops? It says it in Proverbs. When he looks down and sees his perfect image, he knows that's pure silver. And we're to be conformed to the image of Jesus, God's only son. And God wants to see Jesus and me, not Reggie. Reggie is filthy rags. Reggie is no good. But Jesus Christ is Reggie's Savior. He had mercy on me. And he forgave me. He washed my sins away. And I had to depend on him every day. And I love him. And he loves me. When's the last time you said, Jesus, I love you. Thank you. This week is Thanksgiving week. Let's thank him for saving us. If you were the only person that needed salvation, he still would have came for you. He still will let you nail him to the cross. He's God. He didn't have to let that happen. But he let it be. He suffered. Isaiah 53, he suffered more than every man has ever suffered. He took your suffering and my suffering and the suffering of the whole world. He took our sins in his own body. He paid the price. You know, the wages of sin is death. He took your sin, my sin, all our sins at one time on him. He said, God, why have you forsaken me? For the first time ever, ever, God always was. The Word always was. The Holy Spirit always was, always will be. For the first time ever, God the Father had to walk away and turn his back on the Son because God will not look on sin. Jesus is perfect, but he took your sin and my sin on that cross. My friend, everything works together to the glory of God, whether you understand it or not. I was reading in Acts, I'm not going to take time, but it's Acts chapter 27 and Acts chapter 28. They arrested the man named Paul the Apostle because he was preaching Jesus. And guess who turned against him? The church people. The church people didn't want to hear about Jesus. They wanted to have their own church like they wanted to have it. They didn't want to worship Jesus. They just wanted to be able to do what they wanted to do. They could go hunting, go fishing, and uh, have some girlfriends and boyfriends and Everything else, but still, everything will be okay. But Jesus Christ says, unless you take up the cross to follow me, you ain't going to make it. <coughs> so they hated because Paul preached Jesus. And the church folks turned against him. And then the church folks went to the governor, Festus, and, and, and Agrippa, the king Agrippa. They said that he... Come against us. Paul, come against the even the Roman law. And so they had him arrested. You know, isn't that bad that a man that loves God and does what God tells him to do is arrested? And if things keep on, probably some of us are going to be arrested before it's over. My friend, you can talk about everything but Jesus in, in the courtrooms today or whatever. But when you speak Jesus, it, it raises up to where they, they want to write your prayer for you. That's what they told me. That I couldn't pray in the name of Jesus. So let me tell you something. That devil don't want to hear that name. So Paul is now in chains. And that's sad. But my friend, let me tell you. All things work together for what? Good. If Paul was not in chains... A lot of them. Over a third of the New Testament 
maybe even two thirds. If it was just preached, it wouldn't have been written down. But he wrote it and sent the letters to each of the churches. And that word is for you and I today. He will never die. So Paul is in, he's, he's incarcerated. He's in chains. Then they decide they got to take him to Caesar. So they got to go to the you know, to Rome, to the big palace. And they get in a ship. And on the way, they head. And then the wind got to blowing real hard, so they had to pull over. But then there was another ship that was going to go right to where they supposed to go, to Rome. And so they put the cargo and other things, and that ship's already loaded with lots of good cargo. So they put Paul in there. And Paul says, it's going to be a storm. Don't you go. But the man that owned the ship says, this product's got to be delivered so I can be paid. We're going. So they take off. Next thing you know, the ship's been tossed to and fro. And the, it, it, the sun didn't shine for, what, 14 days. They was in a storm. They, they had to, the Bible says that they had to throw the cargo over. Every bit of that cargo, they had to throw it over. When you read it, you'll read that. And then they even had to take, to me it was like ropes and stuff, and they ran around the ship to keep it from busting in two. They had to do that. And they were all terrified. But Paul says, be of good cheer. You should have listened to me. God warned you. But you disobeyed. But God spoke to me by his angel last night. Be of good cheer. The only thing that's going to be lost is the ship. But not a hair of your head is going to leave you. That's what he said. It got worse and worse. Directly some of those <coughs> big shots got them little boats and was letting them down. Paul says, if you go down, you die. Stay with me, you'll live. And by the way, God told me that everybody on this ship, 276 of you, is going to be born again before it's over. And believe me, he says, I'll give you everyone on the ship. They all came to God, what I read. And the ship broke in two. And, you know, sometimes I wonder if a church is supposed to have boards. And I read right there, it's, it's biblical to have church have a board. It says, them that could swim, swam. Then it couldn't swim, got on boards and floated. <laughs> and they ended up in an island that nobody knew what it was. An island called, one pronounces it Melita, another Malta. I don't know which is correct. Melita or Malta. But here they are, and they get on this island. And it's wintertime, and Paul's wet, and all of them wet, so guess what? They build a fire. And all of a sudden, Paul gets a bottle of wood, and when he gets close to the fire, it heats up that viper, and a viper bites him on, bites him on the hand, and it's hanging on his hand. He just shakes the thing off, go get some more wood. They all waiting there on that island, looking at Melita, saying <coughs> he's fixing to die in a minute. That viper is going to kill him. Paul never died. He kept building and dried his clothes. So they began to think he was a god. He says, I'm not a god, but the Lord Jesus Christ is. He witnessed to them. Some of them were saved. The chief of the island named Publicus says, my, my daddy's dying. Some of my family members need you. And so Paul went and prayed for them and they were healed. You see, the island of, of Melita or Malta, what you want to call it, would have never heard the gospel of Christ if there was not a storm and if the ship didn't break. Do you see everything works for good? Let me tell you, Johnny Eric Katana in 1967, it was June the 30th, if I'm not mistaken. And that little girl, <clears throat> born in Baltimore, Maryland, her and her sister, they're very athletic because their daddy had won a lot of things in the in that uh, Summer Olympics each year. Athletic family. But Johnny's 17 years old, and they get to that... Uh, that body of water. And she didn't know at Chesapeake Bay 
She jumped off that bridge like you should never do. That the water wasn't as deep as it looked like it was. And she hit head first on the bottom in those rocks. She couldn't move. Her sister was supposed to have been somewhere else. It so happened she come back and seen Johnny's blonde hair just under the water doing that. A few more seconds, Johnny would have drowned. Him. But her sister ran and pulled her out. Johnny was sent to the hospital, paralyzed from her shoulders down. They did something so now she could, those things help her move her hands a little bit. But she paralyzed. They tell her that she's paralyzed and quadriplegic, or what you call it. She became angry with God. She began to wonder how she could commit suicide. Everybody that came to see her, she asked them to unplug that machine. She wanted to die. It was kind of comical in a way. She was able to try to get to where she could move her head, and she got a hold to the plug, the wire, and she thought it was a life support thing. And all she said she did was unplug the feed tube. She just got hungry. <laughs> but, and, and let me tell you, she was on the news, a news channel a few nights ago. And I heard her tell her little things. The news media was asking her different questions. And they said, Johnny, if you had it all to do over again, wouldn't your life be great if it weren't for Chesapeake Bay? It wasn't for July, June the 30th, 1967. Wouldn't you love for that not to happen? Johnny said these words. I would never change a thing. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Amen. They say, how can you say that? And she said, because that happened, I got to reach people I would have never reached before. Millions have come to God. At least they said they have. Wheels of the world. And let me tell you, I'm on over a thousand radio stations seven days a week, Johnny and friends. And one minute a day on over a thousand stations is diamonds hidden in the dust. And many people have come to God, they say. Come to Christ. And if that would have never happened to me, I would have never been able to reach the lost people. I'm telling you that Johnny says it happened for good, even though here she is 17. An athletic person, but then only could move her neck. Couldn't even move her hands then. And I didn't know it till I got to read. I figured if you're paralyzed, you wouldn't have any feelings. But she, about every hour, and when she was laying on the bed, muscle spasms would hit her, and she would hurt so bad, and she would have to wait for somebody to come roll her, and it, and it was like it was no, it was gonna kill her, hurt so bad. But then God gave her a husband. And he, she said he's going to be rewarded greatly. Ken taught him. And he rolls her every few minutes in the bed. Then when she gets in a wheelchair, she's okay for a while. But let me tell you, she has reached people. She's doing it today. Now, I have gotten the Christmas cards, birthday cards, sympathy cards that she has. She's an artist. And she puts the paintbrush between her teeth and paints those Christmas cards. You can order them things. The most beautiful cards you ever see in your life. She paints them. She does that. She writes with a pencil. And she's written 40 some odd books. Number one seller. Johnny has. You see. All things work together for good. And you take Moses. Everything he went through. Was for good. Joseph. Everything he went through. Though it looked like God forgot him. God was getting him ready. Moses, you know, he tried to deliver the people when he was 40 years old, and then he had to run for his life because he killed that Egyptian. Even his own people turned against him. He had to run. And he runs and he meets this woman and asks this man, could he marry her? And the man says, yeah, you can marry her, but you got to work for me and, and, and keep my sheep, my different things. So he did. And for 40 years more, Moses kept those sheep, but then I read where there was droughts and no rain, and he had to get into the wilderness to get something for them to eat. Forty years, it's bad enough to herd sheep, but then doing for your daddy-in-law is really something. <laughs> and so for 40 years he did that. Now understand, his life is in three different 40s. 
40 years in the palace, 40 years in the wilderness until he sees a burning bush. And he walks up there, and that's when God talks to him. He says, pull off your shoes. This is holy ground. God began to talk to him. You see, Moses thought God had forgotten him, that God didn't love him. And sometimes the devil will tell you God's forgotten you. Let me tell you, when you're going through something, it's important. God's with you. And when you feel God the least, that's when he's there the most. That's what faith is. God spoke to Moses out of that burning bush. But he didn't speak until Moses, the Bible says, he turned aside to see what this great sight was. When God saw him turn aside from this world, he began to talk to him. Moses, I want you to go get your people out. Go get my people out. He said, I can't do it, God. I tried once and I failed. God said, yeah, you tried it. But go and I'll do it through you this time. He says, I can't talk. I can't do right. I can't do this. I can't do that. God said these words. Moses, you got to go. Moses said, why? God said this, and don't you ever forget it. God said, Moses, I sent you into this wilderness to keep your father-in-law sheep for you to learn this wilderness, and nobody knows it but you. You've learned it for the past 40 years. And you're going to come right back here and stand in this same place when I give you the word and the Ten Commandments. And let me tell you what. Moses would have thought God forgot him. I would have to. But God used everything. Some of you are going through something right now and you think God doesn't love you. Let me tell you, it's all for good. God loves you. He doesn't forget you. And all things work together for good. What was the name of the sermon? Boy. Boy. That most deadly thing to farmers there ever was. The worst pestilence. But yet, Enterprise Alabama said it was used of God to send us in another direction so we can have enough money and food to eat. It made us Enterprise. So, remember, no matter what, you call it bad, God can make good. And the sufferings we do now is to the glory of Christ. Amen. 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 I turn it over to Brother Lynn Taylor.